Hello, I'm Arthur Cole. I'm here for Candide and we've been invited to look behind the garden gate at Chilworth Manor, which was the home of Lady Heald, who was the chairwoman of the National Garden Scheme for nearly 30 years. And on this special day, we're going to be taking on an exclusive tour around the gardens. I'm joined by John McRae Brown. Hi. Hello, John. John has the privilege of being the head gardener here at this beautiful garden. Throughout the course of this tour, please do feel free to donate and also please feel free to interact and send us comments as we go. John's going to lead on now and we're going to meet some of the plants that make this such a remarkable garden. John, Perhaps you'd like to show us around the garden. Yes, gladly. Come this way. John, it's an impressive house. When was it built? Well, in fact, when you can see it from this angle, you realise it's actually a, a house of two very distinct halves. The front half was built by a Randall family who were here for three generations and managed the gunpowder mills down on the Tillingbourne River. Uh, in the early 1700s, the property was bought by the uh, Sarah the Duchess of Marlborough, uh, she of the favourite, uh, and Blenheim Palace, and she built the rear part of the house in about the 1720s. So okay. two very distinct styles. Okay, so a, a house in two parts. Yes. And do we know whether um, the Duchess of Marlborough was a gardener? Did she put her <laughs> mark on the gardens in any way? Whether she was a gardener or not herself, I don't know. But one thing she did do when she was here was to create the spectacular walls around the, the walled garden, which we will see towards the end of the tour. We know for a fact that she employed um, workers from the Blenheim estate to come and work here, in partly to do with building the building, but also to do with restoring the enclosed flower garden. And the current owners, they set about restoring and have been putting their own mark on the garden too. Yes, they have. The interesting thing is that they both recognised, right from the word go, how central a figure Lady Heald had been for the National Garden Scheme and also within the local community. So they very much had in mind that they didn't want to completely change the feeling of the garden or the structure of the garden in any way, nor with the house. Um, but to try and aim for a kind of continuity so that the spirit of Lady Heald, if you like, would live on in the garden, but also we would try and modernise it a little bit, try and open up the garden and open up the spaces more um, to really let the character of the place shine through. So, John, the current owners, the family are involved in the garden? Very much so. Um, not only Graham and Mia, but also parents are involved as well. When I first started working here, one of my first commissions, if you like, was to create a couple of beds on this lower lawn area so that their respective parents could uh, plant them up as they wished. So here we have Mars Garden, which is Graham's parents, uh, and that side is the Swedish side of the family. Mia's parents, uh, it's called Mormors Rabat, which in Swedish, I believe, translates into grandmother's garden. Uh, interestingly, the colour scheme of Mormors garden is yellow and blue, reflecting their Swedish heritage. Of course, of course, the Swedish colours. Yes. So we have a lovely yellow roses, peace roses, aquilegias, yellow foxgloves. We've got a, a, a clematis jackmani at the back. That clematis is beautiful deep purple isn't it? It is absolutely gorgeous and it sprawls everywhere and we let it have its head and just go where it will. We, we tried on several occasions to tie it in neatly and to try and get it to train it into various... No, forget it. We just let it go and it does its thing and it's wonderful. Well it certainly pays back doesn't it? Yes. So John there are lots of very formal areas of the garden mm. um, but you've also got very wooded areas here um, and were these developed when you first got here and started looking at the garden or have you had to develop those areas uh, since getting well, here in 20 years? Well, we, we inherited a lot of the woodland planting we inherited from the Heels um, and even beyond the Heels as well because the Heels were here from 1946 and some of these trees obviously predate that. So we had this wonderful mix of planting 
of the trees and we've tried to, in a way to work around them and try to develop planting within it and areas within it and paths within them. Um, I mean a good instance is the woodland walk we'll, we'll go through now uh, which it, at first glance looked like an impenetrable wall of shrubbery and trees and laurel. Once we started going in there to see what we could open up we discovered remnants of old paths lined with ironstone that we have from naturally in the hills here um, and we realised obviously this had been part of the garden at some point so we were kind of rediscovering it if you like which was a great thrill. Well let's us go and discover it now. Yes. So this woodland area originally was quite densely populated by horse chestnut trees um, but sadly uh, quite a few of them succumbed to honey fungus and we had to take down quite a few and progressively over the years it's, it's opened up into much more of a woodland glade uh, which we are slowly in the process of trying to develop um, bit by bit and as you can see another fine piece of sculpture situated here. Sculpture plays an important role in this garden doesn't it? Does. It does yes it does. The thing is this, this garden is great because it, there's so many different areas of the garden each with its own particular character and that lends itself I think really well to having sculpture and to showing off sculpture because you're discovering so many different new areas and you come through an area and you see another piece of sculpture it's, it's a wonderful way of, of exploring the garden. This little tree which nobody knew what on earth it was yeah. and it's actually hydrangea <laughs> weirdly. It's a hydrangea arborescens that's, that's grown into a miniature wow. tree and but no the first year because I, I started working here in November 2006 and as I said pretty much the first year was was opening up the garden and discovering you know what we had and I came across this tree obviously deciduous nothing on it I was looking at it thinking well okay we'll wait and see what happens so we waited and the spring came along and nothing much happened everything else was starting to get into leaf and this was still slowly slowly coming into bud and only when it came into flower late season did we realise that it was actually a hydrangea arborescens that for some reason has either been trained like this or grown as a small tree I've never come across one before um, but it is quite spectacular slowly though it is losing health and vigour and is slowly starting to die back unfortunately. Gosh it's fun finding these little curiosities when you're yes. getting back into a garden and yes. knocking back those that are very doing very well the bully plants around and then you find something that surprises you yes a little unicorn yeah. in the center absolutely so this is this has become one of my favorite favorite plants i love i love this area of the garden generally early spring it's absolutely beautiful but this is is a real treasure i love it John, we're standing under the boughs of a very impressive oak tree here. Yes, it, this, is, this is an amazing tree. It's very unusual to find an oak tree. Now, this is, this is what, 400, 450 years old. It's very unusual to find it so complete in the round, having not lost too many limbs. However, having said that, last year it did lose quite a big limb on this side. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful tree. Um, interesting story with this is during the Queen's Diamond Jubilee we had a big celebration in the garden all the village came we had flags out it was great fun in commemoration of the good ladies of the village who organized it all Graham decided that we would plant an oak tree so that's planted right up the other side um, of the garden and while we were planting that we realized that if this tree was 450 years old it was probably the same size uh, the one we were planting in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. So that had a kind of wonderful circularity to it. Um, and this tree endures. It's, I often think that the, obviously the, the house and the formal gardens circulate around the house on that side of the, uh, up, raised up there on, the, on that side of the house. Down here, this kind of wilder part of the garden, this is the hub around which it all revolves. So this is, this is great, this tree. And in fact, I, I do believe there is actually a horse chestnut growing up in the, uh, in the crown, which I haven't yet had the courage to take out. Amazing. <laughs> well, it's certainly, it has royal proportions, this oak. It's beautiful. And this is a lovely wooded area of the garden, John. One of the wonderful things that the National Garden Scheme 
provides is access to thousands of different gardens with different features, some with wooded areas, formal areas, even sculpture. Well here, you've got it all. So John, we're doing our best walking on water <laughs> impression here. These ponds have actually been here for a very long time, haven't they? Yes, that's right. We know historically that um, the site was occupied by Augustinian monks in the early 13th century. Um, and they were here to look after the church at St Martha's up on the hill. And also, I guess, for the, the pilgrims, because the pilgrims way to Canterbury runs along the crest of the North Downs. Uh, and these two ponds, the upper pond and the lower pond there, uh, were built by the monks as stew ponds to uh, hold their stock of, of fish. And um, interestingly, when I first started, the first winter I started here, uh, both ponds were emptied and dredged. Um, and we were all hoping to find some sort of hidden gold in the bottom of the pond. Sadly, we didn't, a lot of mud. Um, but what we did discover was lining the wall at the back there, which is about seven foot tall, was a whole array of little clay water pipes uh, that feed the pond. And we are presuming that they were put in place back in the Middle Ages, we don't know for sure, but they still bring water from the hills and from the springs into the ponds themselves. Amazing. And now it's nice to know that the, the ponds, instead of having a fish stock, they still work for us. This is the heart of our irrigation system for the whole garden. And they have a great feature in that they reflect so much of the light and the form of the trees that are planted all around it. Yes, it is. It's a, it's a wonderful spot. Interestingly, there used to be on that bank where the wonderful pink azalea is at the moment, um, a big old fir tree that leant at about 45 degree angle, took up all this space. Um, at a certain point, we were deciding, do we keep it? Do we get rid of it? It was starting to fall apart. We thought we'll bite the bullet and get rid of it. As soon as we'd done that, it lit up this whole area. It let so much more of the sky and the light into this area. So you're absolutely right. It's a wonderful spot. These things came down from Scotland, these big stones. Oh yeah. And the, uh, the landscaper who was putting them in place, there obviously was a big dialogue between him and Graham about how they should be placed. Yeah. And this wonderful sign, I think, tells <laughs> volumes about what went on. Well, John, this certainly looks like the tallest tree in the garden. <laughs> it is, by a, a long margin. This wonderful coastal redwood, um, oh, yes, that's a nice idea. <laughs> This wonderful coastal redwood, um, probably planted about 1840, 1850, I believe. Um, so coming up to it, sort of nearly 200 years or thereabouts, uh, 42 meters. Uh, and I know that for a fact because my colleague Thomas last year flew his drone, which had an altitude meter in it. And he was able to tell me exactly how high it was. Very good. And this tree uh, has certain relevance, um, especially for Lady Heald, because this knuckle that's coming up here, um, we've got a rather lovely picture of her sitting on top yes, of this. Yes, it's, it is, it's the iconic shot, I think, of, of Lady Heald um, sitting here. Um, and it's one that uh, graces all the, uh, all the publicity, if you like, of Chilworth Manor, her face very much on it. Um, so yes, she sat here and had her portrait taken. Well, it's a, certainly a landmark. I mean, what's so wonderful about these redwoods is that you can see them from so far around and they're a real marker of where the garden is. Yes, exactly, exactly. We have quite a few in this area, interestingly. There's even a, up the road, there's a redwood close and there are a couple uh, planted up there as well. So whether or not people in the area bought into all these little new seedlings coming in in the 19th century. But we're, we're very pleased with this one. It's great. It's a beautiful tree. We manicure the gardens, obviously, but, you know, we also allow a lot of the margins to grow wild because one thing we're very keen on is making sure that we have areas that pollinators and insects and wildflowers can grow. Um, and in fact, there's sort of establishing a kind of corridor of insect life through the North Downs Way. 
Arthur, one thing I would mention actually before we get up to the wall garden, um, this wonderful bean tree uh, planted by Lionel Heald, uh, Lady Heald's husband, in 1953 to commemorate the coronation. And uh, Lionel Heald, for those who don't know, was actually the Attorney General for Churchill in his post-war government. Um, there's a wonderful photo of him and his gardener planting it, all dressed up in fine tweeds. At a certain point, Graham thought it might be quite a, ni a nice idea to reenact it, so at some point we may yet do that. Um, one thing interesting about this tree is underneath it, there is a little um, time capsule buried with souvenirs from the coronation. But what's in it, I don't know for sure. Something for another generation? Something for another generation to find, yes. What have we got here, John? Well, this bed is about three metres deep and it is chock full of uh, perennials. We have allium, we have phlox, we have delphinium, uh, alchemilla mollis, hellebores. There's a real range. Um, this is fondly known as Lady Heald's bed for the very reason that this bed used to run round the corner and continue all the 30 metres up to the gate at the top of the wall garden. Uh, chock full of perennials like it was. My first job for the first winter was to dig everything up from the bed uh, because it was rife with ground elder uh, and we had to clean out all the roots uh, and repot them and then make a decision about what we wanted to keep and what not. In the end we've left this bed pretty much as it is. Obviously we've replanted and added to it. The bed up the wall sadly we realised had to go. Uh, when Graham was finding out about the garden and what needed to happen. He talked to Lady Heald's previous gardener and asked him to provide a kind of detailed analysis of how he spent his time. And could he send him a, a spreadsheet or something like that? And the gardener said, no, don't worry, I can tell you right away. Uh, I used to spend 80% of my time in this one bed and the rest of the 20% watering. So at that point, Graham thought, no, I think we're going to have to rein in our enthusiasm uh, and reduce the size of the bed. But we'll leave this as a memory for Lady Heald. So John, we're going to step through into the walled garden now. Wow. It is pretty spectacular. <laughs> it is, wow. it is. This very much then is, is this is the centrepiece, the jewel in the crown of, of Chilworth Manor, without a doubt. I mentioned earlier about the Duchess of Marlborough, um, who was here in the, in the 1700s. Um, and we're pretty certain that she's the, the instigator of, of building the walls and enclosing the garden. We know that there is uh, an estate map from just around her time that shows there was already in existence here an enclosed flower garden. There was an enclosed vegetable garden that side and an orchard the other side. So we know there was something here already. Whether it was terraced like this, we're not certain. We're pretty sure that this is where she used her um, workers from Bledham Palace to come in and to terrace the garden and to enclose it with walls. The wonderful brick pillars you see at the top and there's another pair by the gate over there, certainly predate the Duchess of Marlborough's time. We are very confident that they are Jacobean, and in fact we had uh, some architectural historians coming to view the property, and one of them was an expert on bricks, and he maintained that uh, he reckoned they were probably even late 16th century. So they've been here for, forever and ever, but it's great how they frame the paddock on the other side and bring in the trees and bringing all that view into the garden as well. It is an extraordinary position for a walled garden to have that uh, come in. As you can see, it's populated with an awful lot of box and topiary. There's fastidiate yews on the top level. Um, we planted those in uh, and together with a box really to provide a kind of structure. When all the perennial planting and the annual planting dies down, uh, we clear the beds and then you can really see over winter this spectacular uh, shapes of the box uh, and the fastidiate ewes at the back. Interestingly, once we planted the fastidiate ewes, we then came across a, an article from Country Life 1955, I think it was, uh, and it showed a shot of the wall garden. And what do we see at the back? Ewes. So it was kind of nice circularity again with, with the planting here. Um, originally, at the tops of each of these sets of steps all the way up and along the, 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 the borders of the lawns on the top level, uh, were a load of apple trees and pear trees um, but it gave the garden a bit of an enclosed feel and part of the brief I suppose about the gardens at Chilworth and redeveloping them um, and bringing them up to date was to try and open up everything and try to create a garden that was a sense of space 
as much as anything else. So an executive decision was made and the pear trees came down. We actually ended up digging up a lot of the apple trees and transplanting them to the little orchard uh, by the car park and even down into the woodland garden as well. Um, at that point, we thought that was the best way to go because you could see these magnificent walls. Otherwise, they were very much blocked from view. But a lot of the planting on the walls, the climbers, the roses, um, is all pretty much inherited from, from Lady Heald's time, as are, in fact, the wonderful peonies on the top level, uh, which we look forward to greatly every year. They've got a beautiful, sweet scent uh, and flower spectacularly year on year. John, this is a really wonderful place to sit and to breathe in the garden. And gardens have such an important role in terms of our physical and mental Absol well-being. Absolutely, absolutely. And especially this past year, it's never been so acutely <laughs> important <laughs> that, for that. That's very true, that's very true. The donations raised by the NGS are so important to the nursing charities that rely upon them. So please, if you haven't already, click on the link in the description and donate whatever you can. Everything is appreciated. Now, as we come onto this top level, this is a great opportunity to mention these wonderful peonies um, interplanted amongst the box that, again, we inherited from, from Lady Heald's time. Um, they flower beautifully every single year. They're much anticipated. Um, they smell beautiful. They've got a wonderful sweet smell. Um, and it's just one of those features of the garden that, that, that endures and that links us to, to the past and to, to Lady Heald's time here. Very much so. And it looks like you've had a great flowering this year. We have. We have. Surprisingly, given the fact that we had such a, a, a dismal start to the spring and a horrible and cold May and very wet, um, all the superlatives that came with that, <laughs> the coldest, the wettest, the, everything, the driest. Um, yes, we've had a spectacular flowering this year. We've been hit by the rain quite a bit recently, but the flowers are holding up and holding up much better than I thought they would actually. So I'm really pleased that we've managed to capture some of them at least uh, on, our, on our walk around today. Well, John, so much work goes into these gardens. That's very clear. Yes, it, it is. It's, it's, it's very much a labour of love, this garden. It's a wonderful spot. And for me, the big reward of working in this garden, apart from this wonderful location, is the fact that people come and visit us. Otherwise, you, you're, you're doing all this wonderful work, but in isolation. And what brings the garden alive absolutely every year is when we open for the NGS, we have 600, 800 people coming through, families, children, they run around the lawns, they play football, they roll down the hills, they go on the stepping stones in the pond, and it's just great to see that, and that's what makes it all worthwhile in the end. I think you're absolutely right. It's one of the most important things about the National Garden Scheme, is that they open the gates to these gardens and allow people in. Well, for you, John, and for all of the gardeners out there, Thank you very much. Keep up the good gardening. And uh, we'd better find some shelter before yep, this storm breaks. We've timed that perfectly. <laughs>